Deputy speakers are in the technical group, and Deputy Pringle and Deputy Matthew McGrath share their time. We both have 10 minutes each. Is that okay? Agree? Yeah. Here, look, thank you. Thank you very much. I think Keelik, we have to, you'd have to start off by commenting on the timing of this spring economic statement. It's the first time that we're witnessing this kind of statement in the Dáil, with three days dedicated to debating it. Spring, I think, has been the operative word here to give the illusion to people that there is a turn in the tide, a new arrival, a new beginning. Really, this is a campaign launch, a programme for government announcement, an election promise with a caveat for people not to hope too big because that would be economically irresponsible. And it took the government 57 long minutes to say that yesterday, when I said it in a few seconds. This rhetoric only serves to anger people, especially when they hear the government claim that austerity is over and we are entering into a post-austerity econo economy. Talk to people in my constituency in Donegal, talk to people in rural Ireland, and you will see that austerity is not over for them. What people would have wanted to see this week is something more, more like a socio-economic statement a commitment by the government to reinvest in public services and social policy, in social justice, and investment in the people. There are a lot of points conveniently missing from this statement that are inextricably linked to economic reform. The housing crisis, no mention. The mortgage crisis, no mention. The hospital crisis, no mention. Higher rates of poverty, lower quality of work. Just look at the issues around employment. Although employment levels have increased, the quality of this employment has decreased since austerity began to kick in, and these effects will be felt for many years to come. Just take a look at the figures. There are 272,000 fewer full-time jobs in Ireland today compared to 2007, a drop of 15%. The number of people in part-time jobs is 55,700 higher than in 2007, an increase of 14%. More than a quarter, 115,000 of part-time workers are underemployed. Between 2010 and, and the end of 2014, the number of long-term long unemployed people did fall by, fell by 48,000. But in the same period, the net loss of Irish people to emigration was 123,000. And 58% of those unemployed are long-term unemployed, the more than a year. And the previous speaker spoke about how the, the unemployment in under 25s has reduced significantly in the last year. But there are no figures of how many of those under 25s have actually emigrated, how many of them have actually got jobs and got decent jobs. Unemployment continues to be a real issue for rural Ireland, where workers are in increasingly precarious working arrangements. There is what we call the new Irish low, the precariat. People experiencing low pay, low hours, insecure contracts and job security. Unpaid internships and schemes like JobBridge only exacerbate the idea that workers are, are replaceable. Recently, I did a search in Donegal for, on the JobBridge job website to see how many jobs were advertised. There was about 61 there. When I went through them, at least 40 of those were actual jobs that should have been advertised to, for people to be employed, not for JobBridge in terms of low-pay workers for nine months. Jobs that should be real jobs, not jobs that are working, people are working for free. Seasonal workers are also a part of the precariat group, and I encounter their issues every day in my constituency office. They are bounced around the social welfare system, demoralised as a result. They've experienced numerous cuts in their payments and are constantly facing uncertainty. Since the cutbacks have started, conditions for seasonal workers have worsened, especially in areas like Killy Beggs, where fishing is the main seasonal employer. Apart from, them being, from there being less work, it is getting harder for seasonal workers to actu ac access social welfare payments, which has enabled them to stay in their local communities while they work in between seasons. And the irony of all this is that the more difficult you make it for seasonal workers to actually stay in their, in their areas and maintain themselves, the more difficult it will be for businesses to actually get workers. So there will be a knock-on effect there. According to the spring statement, the government's primary focus will be on sustainability. So why, why aren't we seeing a real investment in sustainable rural jobs, sustainable advances in renewable energy, for example, like biomass? IDA-funded jobs are all the rage, but mean that migration to larger towns or cities is increasing. This look, might look good for headline le employment levels, but it is bad news for rural areas, and it's so, therefore it is not sustainable. And we need to build on our local industries. I've mentioned bio biomass already. If we invested in supply chains that feed into local demand and local supply, 
the knock-on effect in rural Ireland would be felt far more than any IDA-sponsored plants that come along offering a few hundred temporary jobs. Renewable energy like jobs, jobs like biomass would stay in the lo locality and permeate into other industries and create a, vir a virtuous cycle, reducing our dependence on imports of fossil fuels, creating a local economy that sustains itself and creates a, a more jobs. Another asset is to invest in broadband. This is essential for creating rural jobs, sustainable rural jobs, because rural people will be able to create their own work by having access to proper broadband coverage. And the creative industries was mentioned here earlier. And the Western Development Commission a number of years ago published a report which estimated that up to 18,000 jobs could be created in the creative industries in the Northwest alone, simply by improving access to, to e-commerce and access to internet coverage. And yet we're still waiting for the ro rollout of the National Broadband brand Scheme. <coughs> and, and County Donegal, it'll be, it'll be until before, not before 2016, where some areas will receive some better coverage. And even still, more isolated communities and rural areas will be the last to see any development in broadband infrastructure. But if we are serious about investing in rural Ireland, we need to focus on all communities. We wonder why emigration has been so high, especially in rural areas. And there's a lot of talk in this chamber about emigration, uh, about it being a measure of how, uh, emigration about how it's been a measure of how well the economy is doing. But it's not all about money when people are trying to come back to Ireland. People are leaving because of a better quality of life abroad, which Ireland doesn't, hasn't been able to provide. They are leaving because better quality of work abroad with better conditions, greater certainty, and not necessarily for better paid work. <coughs> Why would nurses return to Ireland to take up jobs in a completely overrun health system? where they're to totally undermined and they see no, see no future in it. When they can go, go abroad and get better work, better standard of living, better quality of life, better working hours. Furthermore, it's become unaffordable to live in Ireland. The doctors and the nurses are leaving, tired of burdening an underinvested healthcare system, which perpetuates and exploits inequality by prioritizing those who can afford healthcare over those who need it. We have already said goodbye to a pr proper primary care system in the lifetime of this government. <coughs> Finally, I want to speak on the, on the issue of transparency in the budgetary process. The government came, claims that the National Economic Dialogue will include civil society groups in this process. This is a positive development, especially the establishment of an independent costings office. But again, we won't see any of this in the lifetime of this government. Will the national economic dialogue between the government and civil society involve a deliberative democratic process? Will it mean civil society will have a real impact on the decision-making process? We don't know any more about this because, once again, the details weren't given out in the statements. So we can see in the statements that there's little clarity in the government's budgetary protections and there are concerns about its, exam about its calculation. Take, for example, Irish Water. In the stability programme update, which has been provisionally classified as being within government, pending the, the agreement of Eurostat in regard to its transactions being commercial, the net impact on the general government balance is 380 million euros on average from 2014 to 2020. If Eurostat agrees to classify the operations of Irish Water as commercial, this will reduce further the, the projected government expenditure. The budgeting process outlined in the statements represents a warning sign a commitment to splitting resources 50-50 between expenditure and tax cuts while calling it an equal measure. Social Justice Ireland has noted it should be that one third of additional resources should go into tax reduction while two thirds into expenditure increases. Overall, I believe that if we want to see fairness in the budgetary process, we need to see a budgetary policy that reflects Ireland's economic, social and cultural rights obligations. We need at least a minimum level of protection for all ESC rights, including the right to social welfare, health care, education, and an adequate standard of living, which includes housing. These rights must be guaranteed to all our citizens and progressively built upon. It is the only way that governments like this one can be held properly accountable during budgets and during policy drafting and the decision-making process. We need to enshrine these rights into the Constitution to ensure that future spring statements like this one do not make empty, empty promises to the public and are more than just the launch of an election campaign. Thank you. Thank you very much.